So our Alumni in Action series today features three Elon graduates who are journalists on the front line, often I've described as people protecting our democracy, uh, mm -hmm. and each are reporting on the impact of the co coronavirus uh, across the nation and around the world. With me is Mighty Interiano, Elon class of 2007, an Emmy award-winning reporter and producer for Univision. She can be seen daily on Desperata America. Did I say it? Despierata? Despierta America. Oh, yeah. Can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> say it again, Mighty. Despierta America. And what does it mean? Wake up America. Wake up America. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. I only have had, uh, I studied French, so my Spanish is very limited. But I've seen you've been working on it, so. That's right. I can say uh, uh, hola <laughs> and hoy. <laughs> Uh, also joining me is Jasmine Turner, class of 2015, an Emmy Award winning reporter and weekend anchor of NBC News 12 in Richmond, Virginia. And we will also be talking with Gary Grumbach, a 2016 Elon graduate who is a political embedded reporter with NBC News. Gary has spent the last year on the campaign trail following the candidates vying for the Democratic nation, nas, nomination for president. So welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking time today. I thought we would get started by just describing a little bit about what your life is like right now uh, as a working journalist in the middle of this coronavirus. Um, and so Jasmine, why don't we start with you and uh, we'll go around the clock uh, clockwise. Sure. Uh, well, I like you said, I'm a reporter and a weekend anchor. So my days I've gotten to a point where I'm kind of split. So I usually go to the studio to anchor and we really try as hard as we can to keep my reporting in the house. As you can imagine, most people now only want to talk to you via Zoom. So like we're doing right now, a lot of my interviews, I have said that I've tried to get as creative as I can inside of my house, finding all different corners and places to make my interviews look somewhat interesting uh, on the phone, the iPad, the computer. Um, but I do have to go to the studio. I am a solo anchor, but all of our anchors uh, or our shows for the most part have been solo anchor shows because of this, just trying to cut down on people being together. I've also done a couple of um, coronavirus Q&A shows with doctors, educators, and when they come to the studio, it's um, I'm in the middle at the desk, but we keep each guest, we limit it to two, and they are six feet apart from me on either side, and then very spread apart from each other. We've even gone to uh, a point where we're doing temperature checks for guests and us. I mean, we're really just trying to keep everyone as safe as possible. So I will say at least personally, I am grateful to be able to shoot and write and edit from my home. I took a TV monitor and put a setup so it looks like I almost have a home set, if you will, but I am doing a little bit of both in studio or in my home studio. <laughs> I, I have been so grateful for the digital tools yes. you know, that are available to us today that uh, when certainly when I was a reporter and uh, were not available and just in thinking about higher education, we're actually able to have remote education, which would have been an impossibility 10, 15 oh, years ago. Absolutely. I did a 30 minute special about that yesterday, talking to a superintendent and a longtime educator about how we have to transform education right now. And one of our cities, uh, the city of Richmond actually gave out 12,000 laptops just to their seniors, yeah, wow. along with Wi-Fi um, capabilities. And so they're expecting to give out thousands more to other levels of high school. Again, never thought we'd get to this point, but here we are. Mm -hmm. What about you, Gary? What's life like right now? Yes. So up until about a month ago, I was traveling the country uh, from state to state, multiple states a day, uh, covering the presidential campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders. He was holding up to four or five rallies a day. He was a lot of the times doing uh, in person, going back and forth, asking for crowd participation. Uh, he was really loving the being in front of thousands and thousands of people. And up until last week, he was on a live stream. He was uh, talking about coronavirus and, of course, the effects of coronavirus and talking to public health experts and talking to his congressional colleagues about what can be done from his point of view. 
um, and, and as a senator to be able to push forward some of the coronavirus stimulus. Um, but now with him out of the race, I'm here at home in, in the NBC News Bureau in Reddington, New Jersey, also known as my childhood home. And um, <laughs> we're here, you know, working towards the next steps here. Uh, because the next next steps of the nominating process, next steps of the presidential election is going to be uh, the vice presidential pick uh, for for uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, and so Biden is getting a Biden, and he uh, is going to have to go through that process. So once things calm down here, and once things um, we move on from this whole coronavirus, we're going to start going out on the trail and following some of those possible candidates for that nomination. I have thought, you know, that uh, one of the things that I'm conscientious of is that in the middle of this virus, it comes at a really critical time for the country. So we're uh, in the middle of a, a, a presidential election. Uh, the campaigning has certainly been suspended and disrupted. And uh, I also the census, I don't know, you know, thinking about, you know, that only happens once every 10 years. And it just so happened the date for that was, you know, the national census day was April 1st. And that really does dictate federal uh, supports uh, across the country for the next 10 years and that we proceeded with it. So, so much of uh, the decision making about continuing as much as we can during this time to keep our country moving forward. So Mighty, uh, how, how are things uh, with you at Univision and in Florida too, where the virus has, it's been a hot spot in several cities. It is definitely um, not as the situation hasn't been as terrible as in New York, but unfortunately, yes, Florida has become one of those states that has a lot of cases. And like you explained at the beginning, um, I work for Univision Network and I work a morning show. So we have a live show Monday through Friday. And for the last month, we've added an extra day. So it's month, so it's Sunday through Friday. Um, but the regular week, Monday through Friday, it's four hours live. We start at 7 a.m. all the way to 11, and it's become a challenge. This is my apartment, which has now become my studio, um, and it's you know taught me to become even more resourceful to tell these stories and to be more efficient, by the way, in how I try to work. I wake up at 3.30 a.m. We have our first call at 3.40 uh, with the news team uh, to determine what are the latest news? And as you can imagine, now things are changing by the second. So we need to have these calls more often and even earlier so we can all prepare. And it's, and it's interesting to see the dynamics because LA has to connect with us. So does Washington, New York, Miami to make sure that we have the best coverage we have. We're a national show, therefore that's why we have our correspondents from everywhere. Uh, connecting that early and that's you know hopefully by a 4 15 I know what my story of the day is going to be and just like Jasmine said I'm all my stories are in-house so I don't I have not been able or haven't been exposed to anything other than these four the, the four walls and I've been working here I've been using a lot of Skype to do the majority of my interviews and I log them here, I edit them, I send them over to my editor, I send the track, and then it's just the way that it's all been functioning and how to, how to work. We have to do updates, so our show though, it starts at 7 a.m. Eastern time, we're not over till 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Eastern time, because that's when the West Coast ends, and because we need to be updating it um, by the minute, it's just a lot more challenging. And unfortunately, Univision had already two cases of coronavirus. So at one point we were working with half our staff of production. Mm -hmm. So not only were we doing the work of many others, we were under that pressure and that uncertainty that we didn't know if the people that had been exposed to these two individuals could present any symptoms. But fortunately, uh, the cases haven't increased in our, in our team, in our, in our you know, Despierta America team. And we have been able to put together all these hours of live show and and it's it's interesting because we need to keep it real. We need to be giving the facts. We get to interview doctors, but also be a source of, of motivation for people. A lot of people are tuning in to the TV now more than ever because they're home. So we also want to give them, provide them resources to file for unemployment, to request that federal funding a and also, you know, um, be able to share acts of generosity. I think all these has brought so many things yeah. to the table that it's a challenge yeah. for us to tell all kinds of tour stories in a balanced way and in a very productive way. Mighty, you said something really that's important, and that is so many people rely on good communication 
as a as a salve, right? As a as a, a means of well being during an uncertain time. So our communication skills and our storytelling really do provide great comfort in in mm -hmm. when faced with uncertainty. And uh, one of the things I'm interested in is you know so much of the work of journalism and storytelling is relationship driven, right? And so now you're in uh, a a self-quarantine environment you're in your house you're trying to tell people stories and so I'm just curious some of the strategies you're using to, to connect with people you know as, as journalists to be able to tell that story and make mm -hmm. that connection that we all know is the root of so much of our work sure um, what has worked luckily I've been working with the same team at Univision for the last 10 plus years, so I'm a bit older than Jasmine, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and um, you look so young. I'm a little bit older, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, but no, but just the, the, the years of experience had, has made me make these connections that at this time are very useful because they not only trust your work, they know the show, and they rely on you also to communicate, so it becomes a team effort. But I would say that unlike any other situation, a social media has also become a source of getting information and not so much the facts because we do rely on john hopkins um, you know hospital mm -hmm. and university uh, cdc and the you know official websites to get all the latest data but also the stories that we were mentioning how we need to also highlight the stories of, of acts of kindness of, of the people on the front line that are sharing their thoughts through facebook so that has also become at least for me a way to connect with people and and like you said, the career of a journalist is, is, is based on trust and how you storytell. So I think it's now when people remember, you know, remind themselves and remember of those stories that you were able to bring and feel comfortable opening up with you, whether it's after a long day of work at the emergency room or after they've lost a loved one. So that's when you have to put in all your journalistic skills and, and be able to, to tell these stories. And yeah. I think it, it's given us a good chance that to, to not only have to give the facts, but also show that the storytelling has an art to it. Yes. What about you, Gary? What are some of the skill sets that you're using uh, to, to connect? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the favorite parts of traveling the country is getting to talk to voters all over. Because, you know, especially at Bernie Sanders events, some of the folks that are in San Francisco, California with opinions don't have the same opinions as the folks in Portland, Maine, or the folks in D Dubuque, Iowa. And so being able to travel the country and talk to all those folks was something that was so vital to our storytelling and so vital to our reporting. Now it all has to happen on Zoom or on your phones. And so there's not a whole lot of in-person contact, which is a good thing right now. Um, yeah. But it's certainly something that is, 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 is causing a problem in political reporting because that's such an important part is understanding what people are thinking, what's important to them, because that doesn't always come through, especially on cable news these days, especially on some of the you know, mainstream media, as it is called. Um, the opinions of those folks doesn't always bleed through. And that was part of my job was to make sure it started to. Yeah, especially with millennials, right, Gary? Isn't part of your effort with NBC this age group? And I, I uh, one of the uh, articles I read about the coronavirus is that as a, we have an aging population, what's happening around the world is younger millennials and younger people are having to take actions to be in care for at-risk older uh, uh, the older population, and so uh, it's working that muscle for people that hasn't that's ahead, right? We know that's coming as our population is getting uh, living longer and. Uh, and the younger reproducing less, right? So the younger population has on a greater responsibility with uh, the older generation. So I'm curious about the millennial uh, exchange you're having. <laughs> yeah, and especially Bernie Sanders events, his base was and is millennials, it is younger folks. And so because of that, that's a lot of who I interacted with, a lot of people around our age. Um, and so because that's just something that is important to them. You know, some of the issues that was most important to them is the future. They're talking about healthcare for the future. They're talking about Medicare for all. They were talking about, you know, climate change, a green new deal. All of that is looking forward. It's, it's forward thinking. It's not looking towards the past of what did we have 20 years ago and did it work or not? It's what's today and what's in 20 years from now? What do we need to have a healthy environment to have healthcare for the rest of our lives and the rest of their parents' lives? 
and, and going from there. And, you know, one of the things that I think that NBC News is trying to do right now is to reach those younger voters, even maybe even younger than millennials. Um, they just started a NBC Nightly News Kids Edition, where Lester Holt mm -hmm. is actually broadcasting a, about a 10 minute edition about coronavirus, focused on coronavirus, to explain this whole thing to kids. Now, it's obviously meant for younger kids, and they're talking about this scary disease and, and the fact that you can't go see your friends and can't go to school and things like that, but it really tries to get and kind of get eye level with them of, you may not understand a word Dr. John Torres is talking about at 6.30 on NBC Nightly News, but you do understand what it is when Lester Holt is explaining yes, it to you. Yeah, that's a great idea because you can imagine the uncertainty of, of young children whose lives have been disrupted too and not clearly understanding what all's happening. What about you, Jasmine? How are, how are you building, able to connect and make relationship while you're in quarantine there? Well, I'll say I'm, feel very fortunate that I have been working in my hometown, reporting and anchoring in my hometown for uh, almost four years at this point. And so, like Maite was saying, the base of contacts and connections, you know it's there, right? Your phone is full of contacts or your Facebook friends or Instagram following all these people that you've met throughout the years. But I mean, it's been an abundance of messages on every platform you can imagine. Mm -hmm from the texts and calls, the Instagram DMs, the Facebook messages. I was explaining this. I actually spoke to a college course via Zoom two weeks ago, um, just about more so life as a journalist generally, but obviously coronavirus was the reason mm -hmm. we had to zoom in because um, I had it planned well before. But that was the one thing I had, I told them was, it's been truly amazing to me the way that people remember the relationship and remember that story that you may have done. You know, I got a message right before this from a woman I met a year and a half ago at the Capitol who said, I just wanted to check on you. Uh, you covered a story that my dad, you something about my dad, I just wanted to check on you. And so from there, I've gotten a lot of community stories. Um, for example, one that continues to stick out to me was um, a urban uh, farming or gardening organization built these six by four raised beds and they were delivering them to people and putting the soil in and just dropping them off and giving people online resources to grow their own food because maybe people have limited access to grocery stores. Maybe they are afraid to go to the grocery store. That story came from a woman who I've been working on a piece with that hasn't gotten to air yet because of coronavirus. But she said, I wanted you to get this. And we've gotten call after call of people saying, mm -hmm. I need one of those gardens. They're called resiliency gardens. So that's just an example of, yeah, right? I loved it, resilient yeah. gardens. But that is just an example of, I probably, with so much going on, may not have even seen it if it had been on my newsfeed. But this woman who trusts me with another story said, hey, I really would love you to interview my friend. Here's his phone number. He's available today from this time to this time. So, I mean, it's just been amazing to see people. Yeah, those does that. The power of um, building, um, like my T shared, a 10 year, right? Mm -hmm. You've got relationships that are deep that serve you, you know, as and, and right now, I know a lot of uh, journalists are leaning on those established relationships to help them tell stories because they can't, you know, they're not on the road, right? They're in their houses and, and relying on uh, the communication channels that they have. Okay, so this last question is just really a quick kind of, uh, we'll just do it really quick uh, with each of you. I'm curious how you think, one of the things I read today in the Wall Street Journal was that people are watching the news at record levels. So we actually had seen nationwide this downtick in people uh, watching traditional news channels, right? Uh, and so all of a sudden they are our lifeblood again and the value of them clearly uh, resonating with people, right? That these are critical sources of information, accurate, objective information. And so um, I'm curious how you think this coronavirus is going to impact you as a journalist down the road. Like what's, what, how is this gonna affect the profession? What's, what's next for journalism? Uh, as a result of covering the coronavirus. And we'll just do like a real rapid kind of, uh, uh, of uh, questioning. So I'll let whoever would like to go first on that. I'll start if you guys want. Um, 
what do I think this coronavirus is going to bring to us as journalists? I think, at least for me, it uh, may, it confirmed that this is what I want to do and this is what I'm passionate about. I love to tell stories and it's brought my attention and my focus once again on this is why I chose the career that I want because I understand the responsibility of telling the stories, of telling the facts, but most importantly, of informing people. So I'm glad that I got this at this point in my career to like, you know, draw that check and say you're you're doing what you what you're passionate about. What I think it's going to bring, it's going to make us um, have to understand that we need to work under circumstances with a lot less resources. But this is showing us that we can do it. So we need to get creative. Uh, and and you know, in terms of people tuning into news during this time, I think it's it's another affirmation that at the end of the day, as much information that there's out there, when things matter people do rely still on news and on newscast and on journalists who they trust so at the end of the day our our job as journalists is to do that to inform yeah. to create cre credibility and to and to be passionate about it yeah great great response yeah i agree totally at the end of the day what matters is that train journalists with accurate information so great response Maya. i would agree the affirmation of Local news is important. It matters. It always has and always will. I mean, that's the the perspective that at least I come from. And it's been amazing to look at some of the research to show how local news has just been surging in terms of people really relying on it. But it's also shown me, and especially from the local level, just how important it is to remind people that you are their neighbor and remind people that you are walking living and experiencing this with them you're not just talking about it i think it's been a really humbling experience but again like mighty said it brings you back to the why it brings you back to why you declare this as your major at elon <laughs> um, and reminds you that you you don't just put together stories that your storytelling is your way of connecting with your your community and your world at large yeah great and I think so from a political journalism perspective, I think this is, you know, everyone will forever remember the 2020 election as being marred by coronavirus, you know, with the Wisconsin mm -hmm. primaries happening with coronavirus going I, on. And, I and saw the images the of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with going to the polls with masks on and standing six feet apart, but still doing their civic duty there. Um, you know, the March 10th primaries didn't have any victory speeches in person because that's when things really started to kick into gear. And, and you know, Senator Sanders went back to Burlington, Vermont, and, and ha made, said a few words the next day, um, you know, it's six feet apart from each other, you know, in, in a press conference uh, format. But, you know, everything has changed in the election season. Everything has changed um, in the entire world. And I think that, you know, where we go from here as political journalists is just telling that story in, the, in that lens of what does that mean? Does does Joe Biden become a different type of Democratic nominee because of coronavirus? Is Donald Trump a different type of Republican president because of coronavirus? And I think those legacies certainly will take a few years to go all kind of go out there, but those legacies cer certainly will be because of coronavirus. Yeah, really great observations. And I can't tell you how proud I am of listening to the three of you about the impact that you're having as journalists and and just the commitment to the common good that you're each talking about in providing critical information during a critical time for our country. So congratulations. I wish you the best of luck uh, with this. It really is changing our country and our world. And I feel really connected to the world in a way I, I haven't before. Uh, and like Jasmine said, we're all in this together, either locally or right in, in, as a citizen of the, of the world. So thank you so much. Great to talk to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias.